Hey there, Broadmoor family and friends and guests. Wherever you come from, we're really glad that you're here. You know, I can't wait until the pews behind me get to be filled once again with real, live people. But in the meantime, we're really thankful for technology that allows us to connect even in this way. Just wanted to bring you up to speed on a couple of important announcements. One of them is that next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And we plan to have a special Zoom Pentecost service. So if you want to be part of that live event, make sure that you get on the weekly email from the church. If you aren't on that weekly email list and you want the link, make sure you contact the church at bbchurch.ca and you'll find a contact form on the website where you can ask for that link. It's going to have uh, some worship. Our worship team, or parts of it, will assemble and lead us in a few songs. We'll have a time of prayer together, a message from God's Word, and we'll celebrate communion. So make sure that you prepare the bread and the cup in the comfort of your own home. The second thing I want to tell you about is a new initiative that will be part of our slow restart or reopening plan. We're going to start Courtyard Conversations. Bring your coffee, bring your tea, whatever it is, and meet us outside in the courtyard in between the north and south ends of our building. It's going to happen at least twice a week, probably on midweek and then sometime on either Saturday or Sunday. And we'll just gather together about 20 or 25 people at the most at a time, safely distance apart, bring your own coffee, bring your own chair, and just a chance to connect and have fellowship and just to bless one another at that time. We'll have more details about that coming soon, but so please, again, check your weekly email because that's where that information is going to be. And so thank you for being here today. May the Lord bless you wherever you are and cause you to be a blessing to someone today, bringing them the hope of Jesus.
Shall we pray? God, our Lord Jesus, liberating King, Father of glory, I call out to you on behalf of your people. Give them a mind ready to receive wisdom and revelation so that they will truly know you. Open the eyes of their hearts and let the light of your truth flood in. Show them what you have promised them. Shine your light on the hope you are calling them to embrace. Reveal to them the glorious riches you are preparing as their inheritance. And let them see the full extent of your power that is at work in those of us who believe. And may it be done according to your might and power. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the first chapter of the book of James, verses 2 to 8 and verse 12. And it reads this way. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know 
that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. In verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, life is like a Krispy Kreme donut. No, I haven't gone off the deep end. I haven't gone quarantine crazy. But, but just hear me out. My wife and I were driving in North Delta the other day by the Krispy Kreme donut line, and it was quite a line. The cars went, were endless. I'm sure that every one of those vehicles were waiting at least an hour or more just to get a box of donuts. But if you like donuts, they're so good. They're soft, they're fluffy, they're tasty, they're sweet. They are worth waiting for. Sometimes life is like that. But sometimes life is like a Krispy Kreme donut in another way. You see, first of all, a little ball of dough is formed. And then suddenly it gets shot through with this piercing blast of air to create a hole in the middle. Then it goes into a proofing box where it rides this elevator up and down in an atmosphere of heat and humidity that causes the dough to rise. And after this, it's dropped into hot oil and boiled until cooked thoroughly. And after surviving this ordeal, it's smothered as it passes through this cascading waterfall of icing. Sometimes life is like that. We feel blown over, we feel boiled, we feel the highs and the lows and extremes of experience and and smothered even before the sweet delight of life follows. None of us actually looks forward to difficult times. None of us enjoys trials and hardships and longs for them. But without them, we may never enjoy the sweet fruit of maturity. Billy Graham once said, and has been quoted many times ever since, that mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but fruit is grown in the valley. And in the valley is where we find those difficulties and those hardships and those trials. As we approach today's great and precious promise of God, we recognize the context in which it is stated. It's part of a letter, the letter that James writes, to what seems to be a group of believers who are, who are doing well in many ways. They're fully acquainted with the deep truths of following Jesus. They weren't struggling with theological issues or practical living in terms of uh, doing things that would go against God. They were just simply struggling with putting their faith into action. And so James writes to encourage practical daily Christian living. As we face circumstances, various ones of life, and indeed our current climate of trials and difficulties to varying degrees as we try and cope with this new normal way of life, we likely need to hear some of these practical spiritual truths for our own lives. Not because we wrestle with theological issues, not because we are doing things incorrectly according to God's word, but probably because we wrestle with relevantly responding and living in a way that reflects Jesus and can depend 
on the promise of God in terms of how to live. So, what does this passage teach, encourage, and promise? Well, notice how the passage begins in verse 2. And I like how the New Living Translation translates it. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. That's revolutionary, countercultural thinking. That's otherworldly ideas because, humanly speaking, when trouble comes our way, we dread it. We run from it. We try to ignore it, plug our ears, and uh, it's not really here. More often than not, we let trouble become like a steamroller that crushes us and flattens us under its weight until there's nothing left. But here in this passage, as it begins, it says, consider the trouble, consider the difficulty, consider the trial as an opportunity for joy. Not grin and bear it, not uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, not put up with it, not just endure it, but consider the opportunity for joy. Have you ever thought of trials, difficulties, even the space that we've been in these last couple of months as an opportunity for joy? If you've ever been to Disneyland and you've gone on the ride at Splash Mountain, which was inspired by the Disney movie Song of the South, you may have seen the quote from the movie on a plaque along the way, which says, Everybody's got a laughing place. Trouble is, most folks don't take the time to find it. I think that's kind of the same point here. We could see our trials and our troubles and our difficulties and say, woe is me. Why me, God? Where are you, God? Why am I so hard done by? Why do these things always happen in my life? We could say that, and I've said that, and I'm sure you have said that at times as well. Or we could take the opportunity, take the time to find the joy that could be ours despite the circumstances. Look for this as an opportunity to find joy, to be joy-filled. There's also this this funny little word that happens in verse 2 that I want you to to want to point out because it helps us understand the kinds of trials that James is actually talking about. Uh, Is there not that necessarily just the deep, extreme difficulties, the tragedies of life? They're all kinds. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, a parallel thought using the exact same word says, in, this all, in all this you greatly rejoice, though for now, or now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. That phrase, grief in all kinds of trials, parallels what we have here of trials of many kinds. The all kinds or many kinds that is spoken of here is a word that is, um, means multicolored or multifaceted, as diverse as the spectrum of light from red right on through to violet is. That's the kind of trials that is being spoken of here. So all kinds, the little things and the really great big things as well. Many kinds will come our way in our lives, not just pandemic-related fears and difficulties and trials. And God's word is clear about that. Every one of us will face difficulties, will face trials, will face suffering. Suffering comes along, pain, discouragement, tragedy, uncertainty. We could let it blow holes through us or make us feel like we're, we've been dropped into a vat of boiling oil or we could see it as an opportunity for joy. The way each of us faces trials of various kinds will either enhance or take away from the quality of life we have. Either we'll grow and mature in faith through them, or they will forever keep us pressed down. Look at verses 3 and 4 in this passage. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
When faith is tested, endurance or perseverance has a chance to grow. As we face each difficult time, different as it might be, a time of trouble, a time of trial, a time of uncertainty, we can and need to develop more and more endurance. Think about endurance this way. Uh, We can all probably look back in our lives and pinpoint that moment or that time in our lives when we were at our the peak of our physical fitness. Maybe for some of you that's still yet to come. I know for me it was quite a long time ago. It was definitely my grade 12 year in high school. Um, I could run and run and run and run some more and not even seem to feel tired at all. And it was all probably because we had this psychotic new assistant coach for our soccer team who would do that to us. He would make us run and run and run until it hurt, and then he made us run some more. And then we got on with practice. It was crazy. But as a result, I developed endurance. I developed stamina. Soccer players need that. Uh, Just as a frame of reference, think about it this way. A professional soccer player uh, can run up to 11 kilometers or more every single game. That's a lot of running in 90 minutes. They run until it hurts. Without training, you would just drop at the first sign of adversity and tiredness. Now think of that analogy of running and developing endurance and perseverance as we look at, at what these, three, these two verses say in verses 3 and 4. According to James, perseverance needs to finish its work because three things happen when it does. First, when we persevere, we become mature. When we persevere, we become mature. Now, perseverance is not the ultimate goal, by the way. It's important along the way. It has to finish its work. But it has a new goal. It has a different goal. James is, has in mind something what we also read elsewhere, like in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 13, where it says the goal of the life for the Christian body, the goal of, uh, the goal of life for the Christian body is to reach unity or attain unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So when we persevere, our experience builds maturity in our lives so that we can deal with all the issues that come our way. When perseverance finishes its work, maturity happens. Secondly, And this is the second thing that happens when perseverance uh, keeps going. It allows us to become complete or whole. I like what uh, commentator, author Craig Blomberg writes about this. He says, this word, the word whole or complete, this word summarizes what a Christian should become, stressing the incremental character of the process in which perfection is not just a maturing of character, but a rounding out as more and more parts of the righteous character are added. There is progress and development that rounds out our character to become like the character of Christ. It allows us to deal with all of life's tragedies and difficulties and trials gracefully and full of grace. And if that isn't clear enough, the third thing that happens when perseverance finishes his work, and James uses a negative for this description, is that we then lack nothing. We won't lack anything in our lives. Harkens us back to that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or I shall lack nothing. If you're like me, you know you're not there fully yet. You might even wonder, will you ever get there? And so James introduces a great and precious promise of God that is crucial, essential. Without it, we can't ever attain to those things. Spiritual maturity, wholeness, completeness. And it's found in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, 
and it will be given to you. Wisdom from God is what enables us to stand in times of trial. It's not earthly wisdom. It's not mere head knowledge. It's not like the kind we imagine was given to King Solomon. Uh, you may remember the story uh, found in 1 Kings. I want to read a little bit from 1 Kings chapter 4, where it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of, the, of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. We imagine that to be sort of this, this idea of, I've got so much knowledge, you will never want to play a game of Jeopardy against me. Or you've got so much knowledge, you don't want to try any kind of trivial game, trivial pursuit or anything like it, because I'm going to beat you every time. That's what we imagine when we think about wisdom. But that's not the kind of wisdom that's being referred to. It isn't just a buildup of knowledge in our heads. And it's this repetition of the word lack in our passage that connects the ideas here. If you lack wisdom in knowing how to deal with your trials and difficulties, ask God for help so that you will lack nothing. The word lack connects those two. Direct correlation. We want to be able to lack nothing. But if you lack wisdom in terms of facing the trials, ask God for help. And he'll give it to you. And not just a little bit, not just like a little tidbit of wisdom, like a, a, a great saying that you quote later on, you know, something that your grandfather told you or your mother told you or your aunt told you, kind of like from the movie Forrest Gump, you know, where everyone was quoting for years, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Not that kind of wisdom. But God wants to give you generously, lavishly, abundantly all the help you need in dealing with all of life's difficult circumstances. That's what I believe this passage is teaching. He wants to give you the ability to have joy and persevere with joy despite the circumstances amidst your trials. So ask him. Wisdom, as one commentator points out, is the endowment of heart and mind which is needed for the right conduct in life. In other words, not head knowledge again, but helping us practically live out what we believe. It's the endowment of heart and mind needed for the right conduct. We will know how then to live as we believe. And by the way, without the generosity of God to give it to us, we will always lack but we, we can have that lack filled or taken care of because of God's gift to us in times like these. It's his promise to help us that I really gravitated to in terms of, of this sermon, this message in this series, because I really think it speaks to the times in which we live. God does want to help you through those moments, and he'll give you what you need for it. You can endure, build up that perseverance, and look at the circumstances before you as an opportunity for joy because God promises to give you wisdom to do it. And this wisdom, living it out in our lives, looks kind of like this. Turn over to chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you, in the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17 where we read this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, 
submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. God's generous gift of wisdom means that we can have the ability to discern how he would have us live, and it looks something like that. Without hesitation, he gives it to us. Without finding fault, it says. Without mocking or reproach, as some versions state, God will dole it out to us lavishly and generously. God wants to give you the depth of wisdom to handle your trials. But as James continues, there is a condition. We must believe and not doubt. Or more literally, ask in faith in no way doubting. Now, we need to be careful not to misquote or misinterpret or misunderstand what that means. There are far too many instances of Bible verses being misinterpreted or or applied incorrectly or inappropriately. I was looking at a a book that I have um, in in my library as I was thinking about a different passage to to read, a book uh, called um, The Most Misused Verses in the Bible. It goes through a handful of different ones that get misinterpreted all the time. The author, Eric Bargerhoff, uh, points out that the Bible is a life-changing book, but if used or mishandled inappropriately, it becomes a dangerous book. In any case, I don't think James is saying, in terms of when he says, believe and do not doubt, he's not saying that we can't have questions about what God gives And by the way, one of those mishandled, misused ideas that I have heard far too often is, God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not found anywhere in the Bible. It is patently false. Misapplied scripture to make it say something that it doesn't. The truth is, we do get more than we can. This pandemic is more than any of us can handle. Let's face it. It happens. In our lives, we get sometimes more than we can handle. And that's why God says, ask me for help. I want to give it to you. We may question when life is too much for us to handle. And then when that happens, if if we think, well, God shouldn't give us more than we can handle, we might think God isn't very good then uh, because we've mishandled or misinterpreted something in the scripture. And what happens is is faith gets destroyed. So then here in James, I want to make sure we don't misunderstand what he means when he says, believe and do not doubt. It's not in the sense of you can't have questions. James does not demand that a believer never question what God gives them, lest their faith be void, but rather that we should not doubt the character of God as one who gives lavishly, generously, and unflinchingly. God is faithful. His character, perfect impeccable. When we doubt that, it's like we're the picture that was given of the double-minded person, like a being out on a boat in the ocean. Not because of storms, but just in the, uh, the swells of the ocean. Douglas Moo describes it. He says, the swell of the sea, never having the same texture and shape from moment to moment, but always changing with variations in wind direction and strength. That's the image of what James is saying here. We're like that. It's not that we change our mind when a storm comes along. We just change our mind all the time. We're up, we're down, we're up, we're down, wavering back and forth about the character of God. When you ask, just trust in the character of God who is good and loving and holy and desires to have relationship with you and desires to help you. Ask for the wisdom you need and God will give it. And finally, and let me just bring up verse 12 
very briefly because we read it because it's another glimpse of a promise of God where it says this in verse 12, chapter 1. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's hard to consider with joy a perseverance through difficult times. I know that. But the promise we read here in this passage, in this verse, is that one day those who do will receive the crown of life. Like I said earlier, in terms of endurance, we run and run and run until it hurts. But when it hurt, and when it hurts, we often want to quit. I mean, imagine the, the marathon runner who, after having run 99 percent of his run, he's like 400 meters away from, from the finish line, who suddenly says, oh, "This is just too much for me to handle. I'm just going to quit because it hurts." It, it wouldn't happen. They persevere, they train for it. Imagine uh, the stone complaining to the sculptor that the chisel being used hurts and leaves great scars. The sculptor would reply, you are only shapeless stone, but when I'm finished with you, you will be a masterpiece. When we have trials, it is opportunity for God to turn us into his masterpiece. When we turn to him in faith and ask for him to help, when we consider every opportunity as one for joy, even the difficult moments of life, then we allow God to continue to work us and craft us into his masterpiece. So let perseverance or endurance finish its work so that you may become mature, whole, not lacking anything. If you feel blown through, boiled, and smothered, God understands. That's why he says, if you lack wisdom, ask. Ask God to help you to know how to live amidst the trials you face, and he will give it to you generously without finding fault. And persevere. No matter how good or bad your circumstances are in this moment, there awaits for you a rich reward, the crown of life that will never perish, spoil, or fade. These indeed are God's great and precious promises. Reach out to him and receive the wisdom you need.
And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.